morning. Good morning. That being said, I, there's nowhere else I'd rather be than with you and, and opening God's word. Um, so thankful, so very blessed. Some sweet saint grabbed me before the service and said, hey, I, I, I read ahead, I'm going to pray for you. And I said, oh, please do. And we're going to stand and read this in a minute. You'll see what I mean. Title for our message today, as we close chapter one, the downward spiral of sin. Let's stand together and read verse 24 through verse 32. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, you say, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men, And receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, not only do them, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. If you want to leave, now's the time. I say that in partial seriousness. We're going to pray and you can sneak out if you want. I pray you don't. I hope you don't. Someone shared this prayer request this week and I found it so beautiful. I've never done this before, but I'd like us to pray this together as we introduce our study this morning. It's on the screen. Would you pray this with me in your heart to the Lord today? Lord, let us love you enough to love your truth. Let us love you enough to love your ways. Let us love you enough to love your will. Help us build our house on a solid ground that we may be able to stand firm in the storm to come. Give us the grace to keep our hearts alive in you. In Jesus' name, let's say Amen, amen. You may be seated, church. Thank you. Moses called the nation together, Deuteronomy chapter 30, and he reminded them, having given the law to them, he said, today I give you a choice. I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now he says, choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him for the Lord, the Lord is your life. He made this appeal to the nation, so too I make a little bit of an appeal to this nation, this congregation this morning before we begin our our study. And the thought is this, do you want to know God? And most of us in church would say, yes, of course I do, but think that through for just a moment, ask the Holy Spirit, maybe look in your hearts and inquire with a little sobriety and, and fear before him, do you really want to know God? Not a God of your own invention, not a God from someone else's imagination, not a God designed by the devil, but as he's chosen to reveal himself to you through the word that he's given to you, what you hold in your hands, that's where he says, I will come and I'll reveal myself to you and you will know me and we'll live life together. This word that he's protected, this Word that he's preserved by his divine power for thousands of years, and it'll last until the end of time. What will you do when you hear this word? Will you be the one who hears, who listens, who embraces, who obeys all the absolute truth, that's what we call it, 
that he has to share with you today, and the one who by so doing enjoys his light, his life, his grace, his mercy, the joys of intimacy, oh, the joys of intimacy with the Lord Jesus? Or will you be the one who rejects his word? And we do that in different ways, don't we? We do that inwardly and quietly. Sometimes, sometimes we do it outwardly and, and defiantly. What will you do when you hear the word of the Lord? Will you continue on going your own way, suffering the consequences, which God is very honest about. He's open. He's sincere. It's what he's fighting to save you from. Please know that because he loves you, as we sang this morning. But make no mistake, that's the choice that we will make. When you hear this word, when you hear this Bible, your actions will determine which one you will be and will become. He gives each one of us that choice, doesn't he? And as we'll be reminded of again in our text today, it's a choice that he honors. He honors our choices. And so as Jesus said, Matthew 7, enter by the narrow gate. This is a very narrow-minded text, and that's exactly what Jesus said. Believe on me, believe through me. And so too, a picture of that reality is this, enter by the narrow gate. Amen. That is a very dramatic way to begin our Bible study this morning. And maybe you thought that as things uh, seemed to get intense there for a moment, but were you paying attention when we read this, this portion of Scripture? If not, you will be shocked very shortly. This is absolute truth that absolutely clashes against the core of our culture. This is truth that will get you canceled, it will get you fired, it'll get you sued, it may even get you in prison someday, as if any of those things matter at all, they don't. Jesus says, don't be afraid. Luke chapter 12, verse 4, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you what. Fear him. Can you say fear him? Pray for me today. And I was so blessed by that, that sweet saint who said that very thing. That's a brother right there. That's a partner. Because my goal today is not to please people. It's not to gain the approval of the world. It's not to avoid controversy like a coward or, or say things that are simply controversial just to gain attention. But my goal in prayer, as always, is to represent Almighty God well, to share the word that he has left for us. I do not have the authority to do anything different. Let's remember Revelation chapter 3. Jesus praised the church in Philadelphia. You remember? Because they kept his word and they didn't deny his name. Those two things. And in these last days, that's where we want to be. Amen? Amen? His word, which is right there before us, his name, which speaks of his identity and his authority. That's the company, that church, that's the company that I want to keep, and I trust you feel the same way. That's why you're here this morning. Can you amen that? All that being said, deep breath. To understand where we are, let's talk about for just a minute and rehearse where we've been. And I'm going to move very quickly through an overview of this chapter. As you know, Paul the Apostle, he told us he's talking about the gospel of God. He's comprehensively preaching the gospel, and he says, I'm not ashamed to do that. Why would I ever be ashamed to do that? It's the power of God. And so he shares, he talks about the gospel. He talks about how absolutely necessary it is that we receive it. And he also speaks about how little we deserve it. Firstly, remember this, write it down. Mankind needs to be saved. Saved from what? Can you shout it out? What do we need to be saved from? Go ahead. You guys are awesome. Sin and death, what else? Evil, Evil love it, what else? Who's the big bad dude? Okay, the devil. That's all good. We need to be saved from ourselves. It's all true, it's all biblical. But as Paul teaches us here, and it's a shocker for some, in reality, we need to be saved from God and from Almighty God. Because he says wrath is real and the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. 
Why? We've talked about it because God is a righteous judge because sin is a crime and we're all absolutely guilty. That's the point of this passage. Don't miss it. That's the point of this passage. We are all absolutely guilty and wrath is coming. Be saved. Secondly, write it down. Mankind is guilty. Jesus, in Matthew 22, someone came to him. Teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said, I'm going to make it really, really simple. You remember? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. Some would say that's New Testament truth. It is, but it's also Old Testament truth. And the whole law is summed up on, on those two tablets, you remember? You shall love the Lord your God with all that you are and all that you have. We don't do that. We've never done that, and we certainly haven't done it perfectly. And therefore, as Paul says, we're guilty of ungodliness. Jesus said, second tablet, love your neighbor as yourself. We don't do that either. And who's done it perfectly? From the moment they were conceived up until this point, we're sinners, we're criminals, we're broken, we're guilty of unrighteousness, and for that reason, the wrath of God is coming. For as he says here, we know better, but we choose wrong over what's right, and that's called rebellious, that's called foolish, that's called defiance. That's what this chapter states. Mankind is guilty. Mankind is without excuse. We've talked about that too. And that testimony comes from a God who cannot lie. He's perfect. And he says, we are without excuse. He has revealed himself to us in so many ways. And we've ignored it. We've pretended like he doesn't exist. Like we weren't created. Like there was this anonymous Big Bang and evolution took over from there. That takes more faith than anything I've ever heard from this Bible. That, that aliens somehow seeded us. And, and all of those thoughts, those delusions, those imaginations have problems. And nonetheless, in the face of God, that's what we look at and choose. This passage says that we didn't honor God as we should. We didn't give him thanks as we should. We must. And we turned from him. And his original purpose for creating us. We turn from him. And please understand, write this down, that's the problem. That's the root of this whole sin issue. It's not just the lying and the cheating and the stealing, the individual sins. Though those things are a problem. The crime, the sin, is the turn. And that is to turn away from God. To turn aside from the Lord and his purpose for us. To withhold our worship from him, to withhold our affection from him. That's the sin. And that is declaring war against him. That's a war we're going to lose, and that's what Paul says in this chapter. What did we turn from God to? What did we turn from God to? Go back to Genesis chapter 3, and, and the answer is what the devil sold us. Go back and read his sales pitch. We turn to what we thought would bring light and life and joy into our lives and into the world. Yay, it's going to be great. What did the devil say? He said, yeah, I know God has given you just one, just one commandment. Turn from him, disobey his commandment, eat the fruit of rebellion, and your eyes will be opened. You'll be wise. You'll be like God. And they said, okay, that sounds pretty good. Let's do that. And that's what they did. How did that work out? Did they become wise? Did they become like God? Did any of that work out the way that Satan sold it? Absolutely not. And read from that point forward. Instead of becoming wise, instead of becoming like God, instead of rising to a whole new level of life, they fell and because they fell, we are fallen because we've descended from them. And thus we become sinners and slaves to sin. Servants of the devil and subject to wrath just like he is. That's what we turn to. 
What does turning from God lead to? Write that down, would you? What does turning from God lead to? Because that's what we're going to talk about today, and I'll slow it back down just a bit. What song is that? What does turning from God lead to? Sing it all together. That's what we're going to talk about today. It's up on the screen. And it leads to this. Write a few notes. The downward sickening spiral of sin. That's what turning from God leads to. Depravity, Paul says in this passage. Lunacy and endless examples of idolatry. What happens when you turn from God? Very simply, you have to turn to something else. And when you turn to sin from him, sin takes you to places that you never thought you would go. You never thought you'd do. You never thought you'd end up in that place. That's what sin does. And this passage is going to show us that we begin to lose our minds We begin to lose the image of God that we're created, that we were created with. He made us in his own very image. We lose that. And we become degenerated and depraved. Sin transforms us into the most deranged and darkest forms of humanity the world will ever know. And if you're familiar with the the Lord of the Rings trilogy, that's what Gollum is, folks. And that's a bam, a vivid imagery and picture and metaphor for every single one of us. That's what it is. That was the intent. That's the picture. Because we turned against him, Adam and Eve, and so to us, God gave us up. And Paul says that three times in this passage. We'll get there. God gave us up. He let us go is a great way to translate that. He gave us the gift of free will, didn't he? And as it's been said, love cannot be real if choice doesn't exist. Love's not real if there's not a choice. And because he loved us, and still loves us, he let us go. And he let us go after what we chose over him. And even as it broke his heart, he let sin have us and take us and do to us what it's been doing ever since. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And we'll see so clearly what sin is and what it does and what it leads to. Evolution is a joke. It's laughable. People say we're evolving. It's ridiculous. People say we're getting better. We're improving, you know, societally and globally and all the rest. And that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in light of what we see. Because history tells a story, doesn't it? Since the creation of man... History tells a story through the rise and fall of every generation that's come and gone. We see the same thing, the same thing over and over again. And we will see it if the Lord does not take us home in this nation as well. Sin does not set us free. Sin does not liberate. Sin does not lead to anything but depravity and destruction and despair. That's what we see over and over and time again through the years. And so as we study this morning, I pray that our hearts would understand what sin is. Even though saved by grace through faith, and I trust most of you are just that today. But that we'd see what sin is and understand, as it's been said, that sin is not bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. Do you understand that? And that we'd understand how desperately we must be saved from sin and the penalty of sin through faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But also that we would stay as far away from sin as we possibly can through the power of Jesus Christ. Because it still has the ability to kill and destroy you today, just as it does me. Someone said, it's William Barclay in fact, the most terrible thing about sin is that sin begets sin. It is the awful responsibility of free will that it can be used in such a way that in the end it is obliterated, that is, free will. And a man becomes the slave of sin, self-abandoned to the wrong way. And sin is always a lie because the sinner thinks his sin will make him happy, whereas in the end it ruins life both for himself and for others in this world and in the world to come. 
Verse 24, let's dig into this. And, and as we do, those three things that we saw, Paul presents three categories, as it were, that, that cover the paths that sin takes us down. One of them might be yours, one of them might not be, but either way, one is certainly the path you've gone down and you still struggle with today. Three things that sin has brought to us, impurity, dishonorable passions, and a debased mind. And this is how we defile ourselves, this is how we abuse others, and this is why we're all, every single one of us, guilty before God. We see verse 24, therefore, Paul says, God gave them up, he let them go, in the lusts of their hearts to what? Impurity, the King James says, vile passions, and that's good too. To impurity or vile passions, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Someone said those who dishonored God were given up to dishonor themselves. A man cannot be delivered up to a greater slavery than to be given up to his own lusts. God made man, you see it there in the Bible in the beginning, he made mankind, both male and female, for each other. That's what he did, it's his design. He designed sex, he invented that, do you know that? He invented marriage, he created it, he invented it, it was his idea. And as we're talking about sexual sin here in, in this verse, all kinds of bodily impurity, Let's remember that sex is a gift made by God for the confines of the marriage covenant. That's where this gift is prescribed, blessed by God, just like fire. It's great in its proper place. It's wonderful and it's warming, but so too you take it out of that setting, that environment, that place of blessing. It's disastrous. It's destructive. Everybody gets burned. Everyone gets hurt. That's exactly what we see when it comes to that gift of God, and that's what it is, of sex. Sin has come into the picture, and sin seeks to corrupt this gift. Through misunderstanding, through misuse, sin seeks to transform something that's beautiful into something that's absolutely harmful and abusive in every possible way, psychologically, physically, spiritually, emotionally, in every way that this gift can be turned to something destructive. Sin and our enemy and our flesh certainly has done that. We look into the subject scientifically. God didn't design these bodies. He invented them. You understand that. He made these. Blueprints are in heaven somewhere. Kind of a Bible joke. He did not handle, he did not create our bodies to handle promiscuity. They break down almost immediately. That's biology. We see it, but we don't care. Dysfunction and disease are the result of promiscuity. And yet the Bible says this very thing. Proverbs talks about it over and over again. Promiscuity or sexual activity outside of marriage is so uh, participating peels the layers of your soul away like the layers of an onion. And if you lose them, you might not have any left. And God's honest about these things. We're the liars who see the truth, know the truth, and, and if it's scientifically not even biblically, and we say, no, it can't be, it's not. Because my lust wants to be let loose. We don't have to look around for very long to see the countless examples of Paul's point. How listening to lust leads to impurity how impurity leads to, just what he says, dishonorable sexual deeds. And it, it spirals out of control so quickly. And I'm just going to rattle off a number of things. You can come up with more sexual abuse, addiction, broken homes, divorce, fatherlessness, slavery, slavery, and the sex trade. Prostitution, rape, selling our children into a sexualized culture, sexualizing our own children in their schools through the programs they watch, through the devices that they have. 
as lambs for the slaughter and the machine of, of sexuality and sexual activity. Abortion, greatest example quite possibly of this point in this issue. We rejoice on one hand about how charitable we are and we actually murder the most innocent creature the world will ever know, a innocent, defenseless baby. And we do that because of this sin problem, this sin issue. And in fact, God is honest and we should be too. It's not an act of nobility, as the world seems to suggest. Freedom. It's idolatry. It's sacrificing a human life to another god. And we could go on. We mutilate our bodies in the name of sexual expression in, in, in countless ways. This is what we've done with God's precious gift, this perfect gift. And that's just a couple of minutes. Any sexual activity outside the confines of marriage is biblically referred to as adultery or fornication. It's sin. It's a problem. Dysfunction lies there. Pain will be the result of such a choice. Pornography falls into the very same category. It's no different. And on that issue, you, your Bible could not be more clear. Understand that these things are not just immoral, they're not just improper, they're not just impure, it's idolatry. It is the worship of another God, a false God, and that's a problem. And yet we do it oftentimes, God forbid, without even thinking. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says this, don't you realize Paul wrote to this church, the Corinthian church, this is where he wrote Romans, by the way, the letter that we're reading, he said, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or who commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or are greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that. I will amen that. But you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The world says a lot of stupid things, doesn't it? If it feels good, do it. That's the mantra that it sells um, in, in more ways than just sexually, but primarily that's the biggest slogan, right? Don't call me during the message. If it feels good, do it. But the logic of that statement is far from sound. I've heard that shooting heroin is the, the, the greatest high, the best feeling a man will ever know, a person will ever know. It feels better than anything else we've ever found. Good luck with that. I've heard drinking some poisons, not all but some, will give you the greatest feeling of ecstasy, and then what? You're dead. You'll die. Because your brain is... Exploding. Choose wisely. Amen? Abstinence isn't a word that we hear very often anymore these days, huh? Even in church, especially in church. A better word for that is the word holiness. In this case, it means the same thing, and that's exactly what God calls us to. You be holy as I am holy. You be holy because I've called you to be holy. I've given you the gift, the ability to be holy, so be holy. We don't hear that very often in church these days either, do we? That's a sign of the times. I pray you're awake to that. It's the last thing on, on earth that some pastors these days would ever talk about. And some are even aware of these things, active promiscuity in their fellowships among their congregants and suffering greatly because of it, and yet they do nothing because they're cowards and people pleasers. They're enabling sin, and they're going to answer to God for that. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, isn't it? It is. If you are this morning as a child of God, living in, continuing on in, practicing some kind of sexual sin, here's the thing. Repent. We've all done it. We've all been there. But we cannot live there. So don't be ashamed. Don't keep your sin in the dark. 
come and be set free by bringing it out into the light. We've all been there. We've all done that. We've all stumbled. There's none righteous, no, not one. That's where we're going. Be set free from that today. Don't buy into the lie that sin sells and Satan peddles and the world declares. It's nonsense, and they bear the repercussions, and it's right in front of our face. God says be holy. He invites you to be holy because holiness is happiness. That's where your life will be found. And so repent. Don't go on. Don't continue on. Don't be a slave to something that Jesus Christ can and for some of you has freed you from. Come see us. After the service, you'll find compassion. You'll find a brother. You'll find a sister who will pray for you. And be set free today. Amen? Verse 26, moving on, the second thing Paul says that God gave us up to. For this reason, God gave them up to what? Dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations. For those that are contrary to nature... That makes absolute perfect sense. It says what it says and means what it says. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women designed for each other. This is biology. It's observable. It's very, very simple to comprehend. But nonetheless, we're consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men, receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And there are many, many. Someone said, the man who banishes God not only loses godliness, but he loses manhood too. And of course, we're talking about the issue, the topic of homosexuality here. Listen, our turn from God, remember we talked about that turn, that's the problem. Our turn from God cursed our race. We are cursed. And we're subjected to all kinds of issues and infirmities. A host of things, physically and, and mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Listen, same-sex attraction is one of those things. You could also put in there gender confusion. This whole issue that we're dealing with now, it falls right into that category. And this passage could not be clearer. It, it says what it says and means what it says. This is not a part of God's design for man. And anyone who says differently is preaching, declaring heresy. It's depravity, and it's aroused by the sin that enslaves us, just as sexual sin, and, and, and let's say hetero. We just talked about that. The problem is that lust is what sin did. And so too, this is the second example that Paul is pointing to, and we see it. He did in his day, we still do in ours. It's a manifestation of that problem. We are slaves to sin. And it could be down this path or down another, but it's all the same, in a sense. Understand, Paul lived in a culture that not only approved, he's writing this from Corinth, okay? And you can read about that church and all that they struggled with, what they were known for, a Corinthian was called, right? A culture that not only approved of every kind of heterosexual depravity, and they did, but the same was true with, with homosexual immorality. And for some 200 years, the Roman Empire openly practiced these things to the point where one particular Caesar, um, it, became, it became popular to marry children, and one particular Caesar married a young boy, castrated him, and called him his wife. And this thing went on over and over and year after year until the demise, the destruction of that empire. Don't think it's not related. So Paul wrote to a culture that was so consumed by sin that it would implode due to its depravity. So warped by sin that it couldn't see straight any longer. And yet he wrote anyway. We observe here he wasn't afraid to confront that culture. Because the gospel is the power of God. The power of God. To change sinners into saints. Undeserving people like you and me. To be born again. To have a new nature. 
And that is the nature of Jesus Christ. Paul wasn't ashamed. He wasn't a coward. He confronted this culture about all of it. And in the same way, we must be bold, for we live in a similar culture. We amen that, please. Now, is Paul saying that homosexuality is the number one sin on God's list? He hates it more than anything else? Do you read that anywhere in your Bible? No, you don't. I'll answer quick so you're not wrong, because some say that. You don't see it in this passage. You don't see it anywhere else. Is it serious? You bet it's serious. It all is. But we Christians need to understand that and stop acting like that's the case. This passage condemns sin. This passage proves beyond any shadow of doubt that I'm a sinner, that you're a sinner, that we are sinners and sentenced to death and we need to be saved. This passage is not about heterosexual sex versus homosexual sex. It's about holiness and our lack of holiness. That's the problem. Someone said, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality, it's holiness. That's what we lack, that's the problem. And that lack of holiness can manifest itself in one way or another, but it's the same problem, it's the same issue, and the same Savior has the solution for it. Why have we over the years, why does the world think, do they hear from us, why do professing Christians claim that, that homosexuality is the unpardonable sin? When I say and I suggest to you that there are darker issues that we should call attention to, like sexual abuse in churches committed by pastors. Oh, we don't talk about that. Pornography is a bigger problem in the church than this. Believe you me. And we could go on and on down the list. Oftentimes, those who are self-righteous, and believe me, read ahead into chapter 2. Paul's kind of talking to the, the pagan mindset in chapter one. Lord willing, next week, Pastor Andy, the self-righteous person. Oh, you who think you're something, huh? Oh, just wait. It's going to be great. But what's interesting about the self-righteous is that oftentimes they choose, they focus on sins that they don't understand, that they don't struggle with, and they villainize them. Why do they do that? So they can feel better about themselves? Absolutely, but oftentimes so they can continue on in their own private sins without detection because they're calling attention away from themselves and the sin that they secretly engage in onto someone else. And they villainize it so the attention is, the spotlight's off of them and on others. That's what we do. That's how dark our hearts are. It's exactly what the Pharisees did and why they were so chastised by the Lord Jesus. And we're more like them than we want to admit. <clears throat> One of the great struggles the church is having with this particular issue today is understanding the difference between, listen, accepting and embracing and approving of that or any other sinful lifestyle. We don't want to do that. That's misrepresenting the Lord. That's living a lie, not leading them to anything good. There's the difference between that and demonstrating compassion for people being kind to people, truly loving the sinner, and hating, and that's okay, sin. I hate sin. You've seen what it is and what it does. You're seeing it in this chapter. You can hate it all you want. You hate it with every fiber of your being. And any fiber that hates sin is from God. That's a good thing. But the problem is we're condemning to people. Ask them. Ask them. And yeah, you may get some weird answers from time to time. But when you hear from their hearts, you will see that this is true. They don't get compassion. Oh, if you're a liar, that's okay. If you're an adulterer, that's okay too. But, oh, I'm sorry. I think not. And whatever else we say and do. We're condemning when we should be caring, even as we speak the truth in love. This week as I prayed over this text and just, just sought the Lord, the friends and coworkers that I have that practice this lifestyle, that are unsaved, these are people, they, they flooded my mind. These are people that I love them, I respect them, I like them, I'm friends with them. In some ways, morally, however you want to view that, they're gooder than me. 
You've met people like that. They're more moral than you are. That's not the point, is it? These people, I'm not mad at them. I don't hate them. I don't take issue with their homosexuality. They're lost. They're lost. They're not yet saved. And my purpose, my job, my commission is to introduce them to Jesus. The only hope that any of us have. And so my goal, my prayer, and I pray it's yours, is to make my fight God's fight. And that is a fight for their soul to be saved from sin, and not just a symptom of sin. I am a sinner. Can you say that out loud? Christians should say that a little more freely. Only a few of you did. And some of you like jumped in there toward the end. That's good. Let's do it again. I am a sinner. The only difference between my sin and anyone else's, mine's paid for. And I want theirs to be paid for too. That's the point. That's the goal. That's the commission. We need to do a better a, a job with this. In these last days, and we've seen it over the past few years, especially uh, politically, more than ever, we're being deceived into fighting the wrong battle, fighting the wrong war. And this is a prime example. God help us to see past the sin into the heart of that person. Just like you're uniquely created in the Im image of God, so too, that's, that's them as well. And every soul is precious to the Lord. Enslaved to sin, fight for that soul. Get over yourself. And if you just still battle, well, let's, let's pray about it. We've all got issues, don't we? Let's confess that as sin too. Let's submit it to the Lord. Watch him work. See what he does. The Lord is able to give you compassion for people that you, well, naturally hate. He cures all kinds of conditions when we give him the opportunity, doesn't he? Anyone amen that? Amen. I wanted to share this with you quickly. We'll move on. Kevin DeYoung, a pastor, he lists six groups that may be listening when we speak about, speak about homosexuality. Read these through with me just quickly. Things to keep in mind and that we want people to hear. If we're speaking to cultural elites who despise our beliefs, we want to be what? Bold. Courageous. If we're speaking to strugglers who fight against same-sex attraction, we want to be what? Patient, sympathetic. If we're speaking to sufferers who have been mistreated by the church, we want to be what? Winsome, humble. If we're speaking to shaky Christians who seem ready to compromise, we want to be what? Persuasive, persistent. If we're speaking to those who are living in sin, we want to be straightforward and what? Earnest. If we're speaking to belligerent Christians who hate or fear people who identify as gay or lesbian, we want to be what? Clear and corrective. You're wrong. Get over it. And lastly, as we move into verse 28, if this is you, if you struggle with same-sex attraction, if you're a slave to homosexual sin, understand that we love you and we have compassion for you. And... Our very purpose is to, as with all sinners, lead you to the one who can solve those issues and not cure a particular condition, but take away the primary problem, which is, is, is that sin. That's what we're enslaved to. The enemy so quickly substitutes one for another, and we think we got it. We think we get somewhere, don't we? Plays that little switch-up show game. Addictions. He loves to trade addictions. That's not what Jesus does. He cures our condition. And if that's you, come and we'd love to pray for you and, and walk with you and understand you and, and, and declare God's word to you. Amen? Amen? And you will too, church. Amen? Verse 28. And since they, thirdly, Paul says, moving quickly, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, what did God do? Gave them up, once again, third time, to a what? debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And these are the ways now we, we abuse ourselves, but these are the ways that we abuse others. This is what sin does. Matthew Henry said this phrase is expressive of the grossest horrors 
Things that are not agreeable to men, but contradict the very light and law of nature. And here he shares a black list of those unbecoming things which the world is guilty of, being delivered up to a reprobate mind. No wickedness so heinous, so contrary to the light of nature, to the law of nations, and to all the interests of mankind, but a reprobate mind will comply with it. Listen, here's the devil's seat. His name is Legion, for there are many. Read with me. Paul says, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up a debased mind. Doing things which ought not to be done, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Someone said, where does all this violence, immorality, cruelty, degradation come from? It happens when men abandon the true knowledge of God and the state of society reflects God's judgment upon them for this. Lastly, Paul says, verse 32, though they know God's righteous decree, that those who practice such things, what? The wages of sin is what? It's death. They not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Matthew Henry said, this is the climax. Think of where we are in the chapter. This is the climax of our apostles' charges against the heathen. And certainly... If the things are in themselves as black as possible, this settled and unblushing satisfaction at the practice of them, apart from all the binding effects of present passion, must be regarded as the darkest feature of human depravity. We know. We know it's wrong. We know it's sin. God says, I've ensured that you know. I know that you know. I've divinely declared it. I've given you a conscience that speaks to you until you wreck it and ruin it and sear it and it doesn't work anymore. We know. It's a crime. The sentence is death. And not only do we do these things, and every one of you, pick yours, put your finger on it. Every one of us. Not only do we do these things, but we cheer on others who do the same thing. Why? It makes us feel better. Oh, well, at least I'm not as bad as them, or, you know, well, we all do it from time to time. Does that excuse anything? It's crazy. We know it, but we do it anyway, and we cheer on those who do it too. Be careful the company that you keep. How much does the scripture say? Psalms and Proverbs about the people you hang out with. Are they pushing you to Jesus? Are they pulling you toward the doctrines of demons? James Fawcett Brown said, now take this all together and then say whether the world, lying under so much guilt and corruption, could be justified before God by any works of their own. This is the conclusion of the chapter, and that's really the thought, right? Paul's presenting a case, and it's, it's closed, but more testimony is going to come. And again, to see our need for the gospel, that's the point. To have a passion for the lost, that's the purpose. Why we must be saved because we are so very guilty without hope of personally, somehow, someone, someday, finding a way that we can be saved. From the fruit, the result, the wages of sin. We're rebellious and we have no excuse. We've declared war on, on, on God, declared war on God, and it's a fight that we're going to lose. And that's why we must turn to Jesus and be saved. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, Paul says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal to the world through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, what? Be reconciled to God. 
For God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's our message. That's the gospel. Have you embraced that? And if not today, will you embrace that? That's God's offer to you. And I love every single week, and it's probably going to happen a lot as we work our way through Romans, the gospel's going to go out passionately and powerfully. That's the purpose of this book. I'm not ashamed of it, Paul said, Now I'm going to write all about it. Two things I want us to walk away with today, and these are points pulled directly from our text this morning. The first one's this. Uh, would you write it down? Sometimes I, I like to get a little wordy. I like alliteration. As you know, it's nerdy and lame, but whatever. I kept this really, really simple. I am the chief of sinners. And, and would you say that out, out loud, or, 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 or at least to yourself in your heart of hearts? Paul did. After his conversion, I'm the chief of sinners, he said. It's something every Christian should aspire to say. The more you grow in the Lord, the more you will, and the more you want to, because it's true. And the point of this is, is that we would understand, I am guilty before God. I'm not looking at anyone else's sin I'm going to stare into the mirror that the word of God is and reflects to me exactly how dark my heart truly is. I'm the chief of sinners. I must be saved from this wrath to come. I'm guilty. Look at this. The case is closed. I need Jesus. Have you been rescued from wrath by recognizing and receiving this truth? Rescued from wrath. That's Jesus. It's what he does. It's what he wants to do for you. Secondly, the world needs to see Jesus. The world needs to see Jesus. If you are one who has been rescued, and I know so many of you have, as one who has been rescued, the chief of sinners, that's who you are, who can you rescue? Who can you reach out with rescue too, not with self-righteousness and condemnation and, and, and talks of judgment. Sure, speak the truth in love. No one is suggesting anything less. But the goal, the intent, and the purpose, the heart is that of God, and that is to rescue, to redeem. Who in your heart and your mind and your life can you pray for right now as we take a minute before we conclude, that's the one, Lord. That's the one. I'm going to pray for them until they are saved. I'm going to commit ministry and ministering to them for life. It doesn't matter how long it takes, how hard I have to work. Who's the one? The world needs to see Jesus, and we've been given the, uh, the way in which to rescue. That's the point, the purpose of this passage. Amen. And so, Father, we thank you for your word this morning. As we close, would we give you our hearts, as we give you our attention, to just hear and cement in what the Spirit has to say. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you for your presence this morning. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the gospel by which we must be saved and the gospel that we're so blessed to freely give away. Like a seed, just scattering it, Lord. Praying for that soil to receive it, to embrace it, to be, oh Lord, radically affected by it. We give you our attention now, Lord. Speak to us as we seek you. Amen, amen. Thank God for his gospel of grace, that there is no sin in our lives that he can't set us free from. Because sin will overpower you. Sin will chain you down will blind you, will make a wreck out of your life. But sin cannot overpower the grace of God. When you come to him with repentance, there's a transformed life that comes with that. And sometimes and we, we estimate the probability and the possibility based on what we can do. And if we're going to do that, of course, it's impossible. 
And so while I was listening to the message, I was thinking of the rich young ruler. You know, he comes to Jesus. He wants to inherit eternal life. And one of the things that Jesus tells him to do is to get rid of all his possessions because that was his idol. That was his God. Get rid of your God if you want to come and follow me. And he went away sad. And what's impossible for man, Jesus says, after that happens, is possible with God. So if your sin is identifying as particular whatever, right? We've got all these labels. Sin is sin. And we all struggle with it. We all deal with it in this mortal flesh. We all have the sins that we're dealing with. And the important thing is not to be holier than thou and, and dress it up and make it look nice or surround ourselves with people that accept us in our sin or, or keep it a secret from those around us, but to bring it to Jesus and to let him transform our lives in a way that we cannot do apart from our own. The goal is not to make you heterosexual. The goal is not to make you, you know, X, Y, or Z, but to be holy for he is holy to have that holiness receive the gospel of grace. That's the possibility. That's, that's what we're proclaiming here. And so after, or just in, in, in a few minutes, you know, you guys are going to go your way and grab your, your snacks, your treats, and your fellowship. Uh, but in a few minutes, we want to play a, a couple videos, uh, maybe 10 minutes from now, uh, testimonies from a couple of ladies that struggled with one with homosexuality and another with transgenderism. And the thing about these, these sins is not that they're greater than others. The, the reality is that they get seeped into our identity. And when they, when they do that, they blind us from what our true identity is, is that we were made in the image of God, meant to glorify him. So that's the reality of the gospel, that we get to come to him and be set free from the false identities and find newness and wholeness and abundant life in Christ. Amen? So uh, you guys are dismissed. God bless you guys. In a few minutes, we'll play, play that video. But in the meantime, the prayer team is coming up. We'd like to pray with you guys if this is you or if you just want prayer for, for anything at all. Uh, we'd love to pray with you guys. Uh, God bless you guys, and see you later.